working in this All right, hello everybody. Thank you again for coming out to the final um, session in our fungi workshops. I'm very happy that you all have joined throughout the whole session and I'm really excited today to talk to you about slime modes. Um, so this is another, you know, alien style organism that really often gets mistaken for fungi. And I, today I just will share tons of videos and kind of talk a little bit about what slime molds are and just have a little thought experiment at the end of the presentation today to conclude our fungi series. And as always, if you have any questions, pop or you know, comments or concerns, just pop them in the chat during the presentation and I will get to it. So, but before I get started, I would like to acknowledge that the sacred lands in which we operate is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with Wansu Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peacefully share and care for the land around the Great Lakes. Black Creek Community Farm recognizes the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as Turtle Island. So, and just to introduce myself, my name is Adwa, and I am the Farm Education Coordinator at Black Creek Community Farm. So everything I'll talk about today will just, is just gonna give you all a little glimpse into the vast, vast, very alien world of slime mode. So I encourage you to see what really stands out to you and explore that further today. So now we're just gonna to start to talk about what, what is a slime mode. So you can go on to the next slide. So let's say you're going on a hike after like a really soaking summer rain, maybe after today, we got a really good rain here. Um, you may see a really frothy yellow, white or pink slime on a log stump or even smothering a plant on the forest floor. This strange contraption is called a slime mold. Um, they're composed mainly of a really slimy mass of protoplasm called a plasmodium. And the plasmodium is the slime stage of the slime mold. That's what makes it slimy. <laughs> um, so basically that part uh, travels all over the log to find to a suitable site for fruiting. And in this stage, it moves in, in almost looks like veins and can travel several, several meters. And it's also very, very, very sensitive to drying. So it usually travels at night and must get to where it's going as quickly as possible before it dries out. Uh, so they're really long mistaken for fungi, but now they're classified as a type of amoeba, which could change in the future as more research is done. Because they move and they feed like animals and they engulf all kinds of organic particles in their paths, like giant amoeba, and they digest what they can. So the reason that these really interesting organisms were mistaken for fungi is because they are quite fungus-like in the way that they produce tiny fruiting bodies that contain spores that are also dispersed by the wind. So right now on Earth, there are about 900 known species of small slime mold in the world, and they have a completely global distribution. Um, they've been on this planet for a very, very long time, and they've evolved at least 600 million years ago, or close to a billion years ago. And at that time, no organism had yet evolved brains or even simple nervous systems. So slime molds really choose the conditions that are most amenable to their survival and they remember and they anticipate and they decide when making these decisions. So slime molds are really famous for their ability to form efficient networks between food sources and some 
some say they can mimic road networks between cities, which we'll see later on in the presentation because they seem to break the mold. <laughs> um, not to worry, um, slime molds look, they look very toxic, I might say, but they're completely harmless. Just obviously don't eat them. Uh, you'll just get really sick. Um, but also if you have allergies, the spores may cause some sneezing as well. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So slime molds begin their life as an amoeba-like cell. So they consist of only one cell and they begin to feed on bacteria. So the amoeba can mate if they encounter the correct mating type and form zygotes that then grow into the plasmoda I talked about before. So that's just the vein-like looking um, structures that kind of leave the slime mold. And they actually do not have any cell walls allowing for a really free flow of nutrients. So very dissimilar from humans. Um, so these cells contain many, many nuclei without any cell membrane. So they can grow up to meters and meters and meters inside. So if each strand of slime mold growth is carefully watched for about 50 seconds, it can seem to slow, stop, and then also reverse its direction. And then it can also reach speeds to, to 1.35 millimeters per second, which is actually the fastest rate recorded for any microorganism. Even if slime molds die to, to form a stalk, many of their genes are actually passed on to the next generation through their kin. So they keep the same genius growing and you know, keep the family tree of slime molds in our environment. And they can actually get eaten by many, many small animals like brown beetles and things like that. So slime molds feed on microorganisms that live in any type of dead plant material. They really are important factors in contributing to the decomposition of dead vegetation. And they also feed on bacteria, yeast, and fungi. And they actually feed in a really, really cool way uh, by the single-celled organisms kind of all congregating together and moving as a single body. And they are, again, sensitive to airborne chemicals, and they can detect food sources. You can also, they can also readily change the shape and function of their many parts and may form stalks that produce fruiting bodies that release countless of spores, which is again why they're mistaken for mushrooms or, or fungi. Um, and they also are very, the spores are very, very light, so they can be carried on the wind or they can attach to passing animals or even humans. Um, it's really known as the biological computer. It solved a lot of mathematical problems like the traveling salesman problem. And it really provides scientists with a way to solve these really complex mathematical problems by just using a slime mode. And you can go on to the next slide. So this video I'm about to show is basically gonna show how uh, oats were placed in the cities of Japan and the slime mold was kind of let loose and the slime mold actually created the subway, the exact model of the subway system of um, like Tokyo without, you know, in about like 48 hours or so. And it's taken engineers like close to like 100 years to map out this system. So it really shows how smart they are, even though they have no brains and you can play the video. Again, this is just one cell kind of looking for food, which is the cities, and it's just kind of placed there. Yeah, you can go on to the next slide. So yeah, that's just another example of um, really what slime molds can do. So I'm just gonna go through two types of slime molds that I have seen quite a lot in the woods and maybe you have two. And then also two of my favorites cause they have very funny names. So the first one I'll show is called wolf's milk slime molds. 
So this slime molt's name comes from the really pink orange liquid that can be squeezed from the unripe brooding bodies, even though they tend to be less than 50 millimeters across. They're very, very tiny. Um, so they can be found on dead wood, particularly logs from June to November, and it's widespread across North America. Usually after a rain, if you look for a dead, look at a dead log, you'll probably find some wolf milk slime molds. And you can go ahead and play the video just to show the, <laughs> the popping of slime molds is very satisfying. <laughs> Yeah, that's the wolf milk slime mode. Then, as again, they're not toxic, but don't you know eat a sandwich after you get that goo on your hands. Um, and the next one I'm going to talk about is dog vomit. Uh, that's the nickname for it. Um, you can find this in mostly moist and shady areas and on materials such as mulch, rotting logs, leaf litter, and untreated lumber. And this video is great because it really just shows the whole process of slime molds and how quickly they can grow and kind of colonize what's around them looking for food. Uh, so you can go ahead and play the video. This is dog vomit slime mold. Let me show you the progression of it. That's fresh. As it gets a little older, darkening up a little bit. There it's got bigger, healthier, healthy looking or vomit mold. And then the next day, it looks like this. Got some egg yolk stuff going on, and it's also bleeding, which I'll show you close up here in just a second. Yes, and it is edible, but I don't know if anybody that eats it Here's the close-up. See the blood? And up in the right-hand top corner, there's blood leaking. But it's not really blood. It's just a liquid. This is what it looks like after a little rain. You spray water on it, it'll... Black smoke will come off of it. It rained the other day. Looks like somebody put dirt on top of it. Dog vomit slime mold. No, it's not dog vomit. So yeah, that's the great dog vomit slime mold. As you can see, the life cycle seems very, very um, fast. And you can really see how the cells really expand looking for food. And of course, after a rain, and they're just completely gone and the spores are released, which is what like the black smoke would be coming out uh, would be. Uh, you can go on to the next slide now. So slime molds are really important uh, contributors to the decomposition of dead vegetation. So the, for this reason, slime molds, you can see them in soil, lawns, and on the forest floor, and mostly on deciduous logs. In really tropical areas, they're also common on fruits and in aerial situations such as the canopy of trees. And in more urban areas, they can be found on mulch or in the leaf mold and rain gutters, and they can also grow in air conditioners, especially if your air conditioner drain is blocked. So let's say you know, you're at home, you're like, I wanna grow some slime molds as pets. <laughs> so basically, they're really like nice to, easy, simple to grow, and a really cool pet, so to speak. Um, so you will need Petri dishes and a slime mold sample, which you can collect yourself or you can order. Um, you need plain agar that's not fortified with nutrients because the slime mold needs to work for their food. And oatmeal flakes, so they really like oatmeal flakes. And substances to test as a slime mold barrier. So you can use these substances to create a maze. You can create a map. Let's say you want to create a subway map of Toronto. You can place the cayenne pepper um, grains in the positions of this, the cities or the places, and then your slime mold will create a little map for you. Um, 
The slime mold really likes darkness and will wake up at night to eat the oats that you set for it, as long as the container is waterproof. Similar to having a pet, you'll have to feed it a perfect amount of oats. If you feed it too much, they can get very big, very fast, and you have a lot to deal with. <laughs> uh, if you forget to feed them, they'll actually escape the container to look for another food source. So that is not harmful at all. It's just going to make another big mess. Um, and it will recognize if the food is old and it will move over it. So always make sure you're giving it some fresh food. And at least once a week, change its bedding, and you will have a really happy slime mold pet. And I know people will have whole you know, aquariums full of just slime mold. So they're really a really interesting, fun project to do at home. Um, slime molds usually consume fungal spores and microorganisms in nature. So feeding them oak flakes is kind of like having, you know, a $500 meal. It's like their delicacy. You're treating them very well and you're pampering them. So it makes them very happy. <laughs> um, you can go on to the next slide. So next, slime molds are learning, just as animals with brains do, and they can be taught new tricks depending on the species. You know, they may not like caffeine, salt, or strong light, but they can actually learn that no-go areas marked with these substances are not as bad as they seem. So this process is known as habituation. Some scientists believe that slime molds may actually help them understand when and where in the tree of life, the earliest manifestation of learning has evolved from. So it's really showing us why and how do we learn the way that we learn. So a scientist from the University of Bonds and others suggest that slime molds can also transfer their acquired memories from cell to cell, which is really, really exciting for the general understanding of much larger organisms like ourselves and plants. So habituation does not only consist of adaptation, it also it is considered to be one of the simplest, simplest forms of learning. Very similar to how humans, um, as an example of habituation, is when we put on clothes, we stop noticing that the, sen the sensation of how clothes feel against our skin. Or if we're living in a loud area, over time, we get used to all the background noises. And this process is really essential for our survival. So with experiments that have been done with slime molds, um, a deterrent such as caffeine was placed on a bridge and it actually took the molds 10 hours to cross the bridge. After two days, the slime molds began to completely ignore the bitter substance. And after six days, each group stopped responding to it completely, showing that the organism actually has been learning to recognize a particular stimulus or deterrent and adjusted the response accordingly. So it's quite interesting how this one cell is seemingly understanding how to move and to figure out all these problems with just, you know, pulsations and really just like feeling its way through whatever it's thinking. <laughs> um, you can go on to the next slide. So I'll play a little video. This is like a summary of basically slime molds and some really cool visuals. And then after that, we'll go move into a little thought experiment. And yeah. Deep in our forests, something is on the move. Reminiscent of a horror movie, it consumes everything in its path. It's a mysterious blob known as a slime mold. It's not a plant, animal or fungus. It's just one giant cell. So bizarre, even scientists struggle to define it. Changing its shape, it explores the forest looking for bacteria to feed on. Dr. Ian Hans Portman from the University of Warwick has been studying wild slime moulds he finds in his local woods. Ian, hi. Hi. Miranda, nice to meet you. Good to see you. So how's the slime mould hunting going then? So there's a tiny little white trace down oh, yeah. here. And that's, that's a slime mould, is it? That's probably a slime mould, but you can never quite be sure unless you actually sit down and watch it and wait for it to move. Bearing in mind the move about a centimetre an hour. There's no definite appearance of, of what one looks like. No, because I, I think because they liquid organisms, basically, this ability to change their shape. I'd have to take it back to the lab to have a proper look. In the lab, Ian has been keeping slime moulds as pets 
to study the mystery of this slow-moving, shape-shifting blob. What are you feeding them on? I'm feeding it oats, porridge oats, um, which is pretty much all they need to, to live off in, in captivity. So how does an organism that doesn't have a mouth and a stomach actually eat? They break down the protein and the carbohydrate, the sugars, and then all just absorb the goo right. that they've produced. And what about the movement? How does it actually move and navigate its way around? They have this little sort of pulsing motion. Okay. So it pushes the tendrils towards that food. Okay. So gradually, it just moves that little bit further towards something it likes, that little bit further away from something it doesn't like. To see these moving tendrils, Ian uses a high-powered microscope. This level of detail reveals how complex a slime mould really is. Wow! There's a lot of movement there. What, what can I see? You can actually see little food particles moving around in there. They're not just picking up the food and shuttling it around. They're also tasting the area they're around and sharing information back into the main body. The whole thing's basically a network. This network means an exploring slime can learn about its surroundings and work out the best routes to travel. But how clever is it? To find out, we set it a challenge. On this map of Britain, we put an oat flake on each major city. Can the slime find the most efficient route between them? last thing to do is to put a nice blob of slime mould right in the middle of central London. I love this, the London slime mould. <laughs> <laughs> Using time-lapse cameras, we record its progress over a number of days. The exploring slime mould covers Britain in just two days. Tendrils on oats send a message to the rest of the slime mould that it's found food. The cell then withdraws, leaving the most direct routes to our cities creating an efficient network in less than a week. And what's most surprising is that it looks remarkably like our road system. This unassuming organism has proved itself to be a true mastermind, but one we still don't fully understand. Yeah, I hope that provided a nice visual of all the slime molds can do and how smart they are. Um, so they're really clearly a very intelligent, very unique and almost alien-like species on the earth. Um, and as we saw in the video research, students have also set up models of policy problems for slime molds to work through, such as modeling the border. Um, also, petri dishes are also divided in half and resources are unevenly distributed to model drug policy. Um, they use valerian root and slime molds tend to seek out the valerian root despite the fact that it could kill them, very similar to drug addiction in humans. So when we witness the decision-making of slime molds, it allows us to take an almost humbler perspective on human intelligence because um, since as humans, we assess our environment and we make decisions just like the slime molds, but obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that because we have made things personal, there's ego involved, and there's a lot of other things that obviously make us different from slime molds. Um, Slime molds are sometimes also called superorganisms, which is an organism made up of organisms, both many and one at the same time. And some may argue that humans are almost following that same suit. So with the impact of technology, almost meshing us all together into one big virtual world, slime molds come together to solve mazes and find creative ways to avoid disaster, close to how humans collectively, you know, organize to push towards a goal. So just like the Tokyo transit problem, um, slime mold solved what have taken engineers, you know, 100 years to solve in 48 hours. And it's really fascinating how these organisms really are the answer to all these, you know, complex um, math problems, complex computing problems, and things that really just take us as humans a really long time. Nature already provides us the answers. So I'm just really curious to see if anybody has any comments or opinions on slime molds and if they have any ideas of what slime molds can add to our future with all these, you know, efficiency problems that we now have. <laughs> uh, 
I'd be interested to see if like cities could test efficiency of railway and subway systems using slime molds, right? And like using them to, uh, if they're already created, measure up to see if there's maybe new routes they can make or if they're planning new cities and new like infrastructure stuff, if slime mold can somehow help in like the design of it all, which would be really cool. Yeah, exactly. I think especially now um, with, you know, cities getting bigger and more people moving into urban areas and obviously people need to get around. And yeah, these pro these slime molds have the answers just locked into them with some oatmeal um, over, you know, taking years to uh, map out these really efficient systems. So it's really interesting how, yeah, the answers are always just right underneath our feet. <laughs> if anyone has any questions at all, or if anyone's going to start their own slime mold, um, aquarium thingy. <laughs> uh, Thomas? I have a question. I don't know if other people also are wondering, but um, since you first mentioned it, I it's been sort of unclear as to like exactly how they're helpful. Like I get that they can grow and create these maps, but like what does, what do, what they're creating, what does that tell the engineers or the mathematicians or whatever? Like how does that translate and then also i'm looking i want to do the like i want to have like a slime mold pet and i'll i'll, I'll, I'll look into that <laughs> yeah, please do it yeah. yeah that's a that's a good question um so basically um i used to like study algorithms and stuff like that so when you have an algorithm like the traveling salesman problem which is just like logic problems um you basically you spend like time like going through all the math equations, going through this, going through that to get to what the slime mold solves in like 48 hours. So basically it provides a visual of the answer and that without doing all the formulas and stuff. So what we take, you know, we write down a paper, we do on calculators, we do diagrams, all this work uh, to get that visual in the end to then translate that into real life. The slime mold just does that in 48 hours, if that makes more sense. That helps a bit. So like you can control, like if it's like a function, like a math function, you can like control the slime mold enough to, and then see where it takes it. So it's like, okay, I think that that helps a bit. Yeah. 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 So like, if you have like cool. a graph, you just put like, let's see a point on a graph. You need to find like the fastest route to the points in your graph. You would just put oatmeal as your points. And then drop oh. Yeah, and then it'll find the shortest. And then, route. and it, like it wants to save energy, so it's going to, it's going to do the. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Cool. I see. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So slime molds, they don't like to answer Alice's question. Um, they don't like like cayenne pepper and like random things, like each slime mold has things they don't like. So that's what you can use as barriers to like make your maze. So you can use like cayenne pepper and kind of make a little maze and the slime mold's like, oh, like, I don't like that. I just want my oatmeal. So we would just avoid that. And yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you don't want to go to through a park or something and you want to create like a slime mold experiment, you can just make your parks cayenne pepper and make your, your good spots oats. And then you have your network uh, made. So they're really, they're really funky. They're very cool. <laughs> and I hope more of it is used in the future to plan out cities. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, no, they can't smell actually. I don't think they can smell. Who knows? <laughs> um, but they, so they sense the oatmeal because there's a bacteria or like something parts of the oatmeal that they actually really really like that's like mm, delicious so it's just like if we're really hungry and like we see I don't know a burger place we're like oh I gotta get to that burger place so that's like kind of what they're sensing but they don't have a brain or anything so they just kind of sense it through like pulsations um and then those pulsations when they're like mm, we're getting closer we're getting closer passes to the other cells and they're like all pulsating together and that's what they create the little like fractal looking networks of it. That answers your Bi question. Oops. Bi uh, bipulsate, bipulsation, do you mean like 
almost like like a like a sort of metaphorical echolocation. Ooh, nice. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So they're kind of like on a microscopic level, you can see as they're like looking for where to go, they're like sending out almost like a heartbeat looking um, organism. So like they look like they have a heartbeat and that's how they like tell the other parts of their cell, like what's going on. And their surroundings. Yeah, yeah. So they're all kind of like working together, like simultaneously to solve the problem all simultaneously. So it's really, it's really fascinating. And I'm not sure if they've used, been used in really any real world planning problems. I'm, I know a lot of uh, computer scientists use it to solve like the more logic based than math problems. Um, I'm not sure how far the applications have gone, but cause it's still very new. Like all slime mold stuff is all quite new. And I think they just realized they weren't fungi maybe like eight ish years ago. So yeah, we're still learning a lot about them because they're quite, yeah, they're very small. They're very, you know, <laughs> you could, they're easily missed. But yeah, I think more research is going into it. Yeah, yeah, that's so smart. Yeah, you should totally, yeah, get some, you know, agar plates and just spell out maybe your name and see. <laughs> I'm sure they make a really cool art project as well. Um, and they're quite easy to keep. Um, they, they do interact with fungi. They're kind of have like almost a symbiotic relationship. Um, they like slime molds produce spores and fungi produce spores. And I think slime molds sometimes may eat some parts of the fungi. Um, but yeah, everything always has like fungi, like mushrooms and lichen and slime molds. They all kind of have this symbiotic relationship because you look at a log and you see all three of them in one space. So yeah. Slime molds are very cool. And you can have your own little pet that is like very low maintenance. <laughs> and it acts like a pet too, you gotta feed it. <laughs> are there any other questions or comments? Anything at all? <laughs> And I hope y'all will start your own little slime mold <laughs> um, zoos almost. <laughs> so I think that'd be really cool to see. And I wanna see pictures of that. And also really pretty colors as well. Um, so like, like bright yellow, bright pink. Um, no, I wouldn't attract any other types of mold um, because you would have to keep them contained uh, because if you let, them loose a little bit, then they're gonna go out everywhere. So yeah, you have to, you have to keep, it's like a pet, you gotta keep them in their cage so they don't ruin your whole house because they'll just start looking for food in your house. Um, so yeah, so as long as it's contained, so I won't really attract anything bad. As long as you just give it oatmeal in its little cage, it'll be happy. And this changes bedding every week. Yes, yes, send me pictures I want to see. <laughs> then you can name them. I don't know. <laughs> you can also set up time lapse and watch them grow overnight. Yeah, slime mold all over the walls would be very interesting. And they're quite an interesting texture too. Like they really do feel like mold, like not mold, like slimy and <laughs> uh, yes, Thomas. But like for the pets, like it's not, this is silly, but it's not toxic. Like so there's like two breathe in like do I have to like air out my room or something or because it's gonna be an enclosed space right like is there any health no no you're, you're good they're 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 simultaneous almost like literally everywhere you walk through a forest so either way like you'd be like breathing in even though it's like a closed space like they still release spores but once they're covered and you keep that covered and maybe um mm -hmm. the oats in you still cover them again because if you expose them then they're gonna spore out and that's when you're gonna see them uh, kind of like uh, yeah they'll spill over your like agar dish if you leave them exposed so yeah just oh, keep them okay in. yeah because yeah. um yeah those fed spores just looking for more food that's the reason that they do that but 
Yeah, you can beat them in. They're fine. Okay. Um, just don't consume large amounts of them because it was <laughs> <just> really sick. <laughs> don't eat those slimy slime balls for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, just want to say, all right, then I'll say a really big thank you for everyone for coming out for this fun guy series. I really appreciate it. I had lots of fun talking about this. We can talk about this for like years, but thank you all for listening and I hope you learned something. And yeah, I think this uh, learning about, you know, mushrooms and lichen and slime molds are really cool because they're really small and most of the time you don't really notice the small things and they really like change, you know, your perspective on stuff because now you're actually looking for all these things and it makes your walks a lot more magical. Yeah, find some dog, <laughs> that sentence is funny. <laughs> Gonna find me some dog vomit and try eating it. Yeah, we should all find some dog vomit <laughs> and eat it. <laughs> but yes, thank you again, everybody. Really appreciate it. And of course, if you have any questions, just send me an email or want to share any pictures or want to talk more about slime molds and what we can learn from them. I'm always happy. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Tristan, everybody. Really appreciate it. Hope you all have a great evening and maybe go out and get some slime molds because it just rained, so they're out popping. <laughs> you get your pet tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. It was fun. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Yes, have a good evening. <laughs> Bye.